Good morning, church. Glad that you can be with us digitally um, and uh, excited that we're able to still gather and uh, worship God together and look into His Word and see what He has for us today. Uh, in my last sermon that I preached right before I went on vacation, as a side note there, Pastor Tim and Shauna, uh, they're on vacation currently, and so I'd encourage you, keep them in your prayers. Uh, may they have good rest in this time because we're we're actually quite busy at the church. It's a different type of busy, but um, keep them in your prayers. Anyways, uh, in my last sermon, we talked about the Christian practice of dying to self. And if you haven't seen that, uh, you can go back and watch it. Um, but we talked about that. And in it, I used the example of one of Jesus's healings, where he has a group of lepers that come to him and he heals them, but he heals them in a very interesting way. And I, I thought this was quite neat. Um, he tells them to go and make their way to the priest to check to see that they're clean. And as they're walking, as they progress closer and closer to wherever the priest was, um, their body gets restored bit by bit. And I, so I use this example um, of how he could look at, you know, a scab that popped off or something and say, that's my old self and this is the new self. And we use that as an example. I say all that because today we're going to look at three healings that Jesus did in the Bible and, and talk about them a bit and see what we can learn from them. Jesus' healings, they brought in a lot of crowds. They brought in a, a great amount of people. Um, in fact, one of the lepers that we talk about today, Jesus told him, uh, don't, don't tell anyone about this because he wanted to do work. But the guy went and told people anyways. And it says he actually couldn't go into the towns anymore because whenever he went, he was just overwhelmed with busyness from these people. However, um, we have to remember not to be amazed by the healing that takes place. That might be a weird thought. But what we do need to remember is it's not the healing that amazes us or should amaze us. Rather, it's the healer. Oftentimes, people will get so focused on um, the miraculousness that Christ leaves in his wake, if we want to use that term, than focused on Christ. And as Pastor David preached last week, uh, we need to keep our eyes on Christ. We need to keep focused on Christ and see what we can learn from Him and follow Him in His ways and His interaction with the broken. Too often, people get caught chasing signs and wonders, and they completely forget about the source of those signs and wonders. They have an encounter with God, but if it wasn't miraculous in their definition, then they're not pleased with it. And so that's, uh, that's something we want to stray away from. We're going to say a prayer. I encourage you at home to pray along, and then we'll dive into the Word. Lord, we thank you for your Word. We thank you, God, that we have this record that we can learn from. I pray that in all things we would glorify you. Help me to speak well today. Help us to be focused on you and your ways and your Word and what we can learn and grow in our faith in you, God. We love you, Lord. Amen. The first story I want to, us to look at today, it comes from the book of Mark, uh, chapter 1, verses 40 to 45, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It reads, And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it, and it spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was in a desolate places, and people were coming from every were coming to him from every quarter. So in this story, we have a leper. Now we've talked about leprosy in the past, and today leprosy is a is a much more specific disease. The leprosy we read about in the Bible would have covered a broad range of skin diseases, but including the leprosy that we deal with today. And the leper was an outcast. 
This was someone who was put outside of the city walls um, and, and was told that they cannot come around the crowds because of the contagiousness of it. Um, and they really didn't know how to, to treat it, right? And so they put them out there and often they would have garments with bells on them. Um, and when people would come, when a leper would be coming through, people would start yelling and screaming to warn people, the leper's coming, you know, get out of the way, get, get the, you don't want to be near this person. And so there's a sense of the humanity that's lost in that as well. As well. Um, but he comes to Jesus, and so he's already making a risk by just simply approaching the, the general population and approaching Christ. And he comes before Jesus, and he recognizes the greatness of the one in front of him. And he kneels down, he bows before Christ, um, and, and he says, If you will, you can. He has an understanding and he shows the proper level of authority. The Christ is up here and we are down here. He bows before his king, as it were. He shows great respect and submission. But the, the wording that he uses is what we want to focus on today is very important. He says, if you will, you can make me clean. That's important. Hang on to that. I've sat in many services where healing um, is being pursued at the altar. And oftentimes it's not that prayer of, Lord, if you will, you can do this. Instead, people will often try to command God in a way. They'll say things like, Lord, heal this man. And to some degree, I understand they're operating, to, some are operating in faith and that they just want to have that faith and proclaim it and, and, and not show any sense of doubt. Um, but there's others, I think, who think they, they can just bend the power of God to their own will. And that's a very dangerous thought to have because you certainly cannot. We'll talk about that a bit more later as well. However, in this story, the leper comes and recognizes the place of Christ. He has faith in what Christ can do and asks if he will. Um, and then Christ does it, and the man is immediately done well, is made well. One other thing to note is, just because I love this, is oftentimes when Christ would heal one of these people with leprosy, he, he stretches out his hand and he touches them first. And then he says, I will. You are made well, be cleaned, rise, something like that. But by touching him, he's not only healing their physical needs, he's also touching their mind, their sense of self. You can imagine being cast out and, and pushed away from your family and your friends and those that you love and no one wanting to be around you. And then to have someone come up and touch you, uh, that's a very important part of the sense of humanity that we hold. And that's often overlooked. It's a great story. We'll come back to it. Uh, the next one I want to look at comes from Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 to 13. It reads, When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come into, from the east and the west and recline at a table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into utter darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. This is a very interesting story. There's a lot here, a lot here that you don't want to miss. Um, first of all, let's consider the context. So we have Israel being oppressed, basically, by the Romans. The Romans are there. They're taxing Israel. In, in this city was one of the tax stations. Um, and they're taxing the Israelites uh, a ridiculous amount of tax. And so even to associate with the Romans would have given you a bad reputation. 
You can think in the Bible about the amount of hatred towards the tax collector because this was someone who worked for the Romans and and took the resources of the people there. And so um, to to even associate with the centurion or to help the centurion, to to show kindness to this Roman um, would have been frowned upon by many in, in this area. But Jesus takes it a step further. Actually, he turns to the Israelites around him, the people of God, uh, the, the disciples that he has been walking with, teaching. And, and he says, uh, in, in all of you, I have not seen faith like this man. Think about that. That's actually kind of offensive. Like, could you imagine being one of the disciples? You've been walking with Jesus for however long. You've been listening to his teachings. You've been having deep conversations with him. You, you've been opening your heart to him. You've watched him perform miracles and, and listened to him unlock the truths of the, of the ways of God. And after observing all these miracles, to have him turn and say, this Roman has more faith, has stronger faith than you. That's, that's offensive. But do you know what that does? It makes you want to have a stronger faith. You can imagine a baseball team where you're out there and your team and you're practicing, you're doing drills and, and you're, you know, you're getting some strikeouts, but you're hitting some home runs and you're running the bases, you're doing all this stuff. It's been a while uh, since I played baseball. Um, and then you have some new guy come on who has no history with the game. But he seems to be able to throw further, and he seems to be able to hit the ball farther, and, and he can run faster. And the coach takes him before everyone else and says, I have never seen a player like this. You might be offended by that a little bit, but you're also going to want to run faster, throw harder and with accuracy, and hit the ball further and further with your bat. In, in a way, that's what he's doing here. He takes it a step further, though, and he talks about this meal. In, in the Eastern culture, in the culture that we're looking at here, this was a huge thing. Meals were pivotal in so much of the church. And for, for him to paint this picture of a dinner table being set with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob there, I mean, to me, as a Gentile, but one who is in the faith, that sounds incredible. That sounds like a meal that I want to sit down at. How much more for the Jew who grew up with these stories being told to them of these men of the faith, these heroes of the faith? That's, that's a huge deal for them to sit down at that table. But Jesus says that people from the East and the West, the, the Gentiles, they will come and reside at that table. And that so many who are in, the, are, are in Israel will be cast out. He paints this picture here as a sub-point for us today that the gospel and the kingdom of God is not just for the Jew, but it's for all. Jesus taught that from the start. It was very important. But then he turns to the centurion and he says, what you have believed for, let it be done. And in that moment, his servant is healed. Notice, though, the centurion comes before Christ and he recognizes, once again, the authority that Christ has. Like I said, this is not a man who had the biblical background of a Jew. He, he's a foreigner in this land. He hasn't walked with Christ and listened to his teachings. He hasn't sat down at the nighttime fire at supper time and opened his heart to Christ and, and had deep conversations with him. He hasn't had that. He hasn't um, witnessed miracle after miracle and questioned Christ and, and prayed with him and learned from him. But yet there's something about him that he recognizes, the authority of Christ. And when he comes to Christ and says, I have this problem, Christ says, I'll come right now and heal him. But he says, I'm not even worthy to have you come under my roof. He, as a man of authority, you can imagine the temptation of, to be prideful in that, to, to be a ruler, basically, to some degree. He had ruling over the Israelites, over his soldiers as well. But he recognized that Christ was above that, that he didn't even have um, the level to have Christ come into his home. And he says, just say the word and it'll be done. He recognized that he, as a Roman centurion, had authority over his soldiers, he also had authority over the Israelites there. He could make them walk a mile to carry his gear and all that stuff. Um, but he recognized that Christ had an authority that goes beyond that. That he could simply say to the sickness 20, 30, 40 miles away, 
be gone, and it was gone. He recognized the authority of Christ, and he had faith in Christ's capabilities. And he asked, will you do this? It's very, very interesting. Um, Let me see where I am. These two stories, they share something very similar that we need to look at. Two things we should probably focus on. First is the faith. Both of them came to Christ not questioning his capabilities, but realizing that he was the answer to the problem. That he, he could do something about it. It wasn't a maybe or an if, but rather it was a, if you will. They also recognized the authority, the, the royalty, the supremeness of Christ. The leper comes and he bows low before Christ, lowering himself physically and honoring Christ as above him. The centurion calls out to him and then says, I'm not even worthy to have you come into my house, but just say it and it will be done. They recognized who he is. Here's some questions. Uh, in In your life, where does your faith lie? Does your faith lie in your own ability? Does your faith lie in the the government of, of the nation that you reside in? Or is your faith in Christ? Do you have a faith in Him and what He's capable and what He can do and, and who He is? In your life, what reverence do you hold for Christ? Do you honor Him? Do, do you recognize how worthy of glory and praise and honor He is that, that we should treat Him in, in a way of reverence? I had a friend, I've mentioned this before, we were in Thailand and we were sharing a room and uh, he went to say his prayers that night before he went to sleep and he actually got up on his bed and knelt. And so when he was finished praying, I asked him, Andrew, you know, what, what are you doing? Well, why are you praying like that? He's not a legalistic person. And he said that um, he felt he was getting too familiar, too um, casual with God. And so when he prayed, he wanted to bow as if he was in the throne room of God to remind himself of the kingship, of the royalty, of the divineness of the one he went before. It's something we should take into account is how do I see God? Do I reverence him? That's a very important thing. That the sobering examination of your life may reveal doubt to you. It might reveal fear of, you know, well, what if what if this problem can't be solved? What if I can't be healed? What if my needs can't be met? What if um, you know, what if there's no hope for me? Sorry, that's a habit, cracking my knuckles with this mic. But um, what, what if, you know, or, or doubt in the things that you believe in the corner of your mind, there might be that thought as, as a Christian. You might think, do I really believe all this? And we can read the Bible and we can see these people of great faith and, and we wonder, do I have faith like that? Or maybe there's pain in your life like physical suffering or or mental pain in your life, and you wonder, why am I still going through this? I read the Bible and I see these stories of God doing all these wonderful healings, and yet I stand here in pain. Why is that? You might have heard some people have answers to that question, inappropriate answers, answers that uh, make me a little angry. Answers like this, you need more faith. You don't have enough faith in your life that your, your, your faith is lacking. And if you had perfect faith, then you would have been made well. You would have been healed. I don't like that. Um, or, or the idea that, um, that there's a sin in your life that you haven't addressed. And you need to figure out what that sin is. Make it right. Ask for forgiveness. And then you'll be healed. Or even ones of, of greater superstition. I once, uh, I met a man uh, much older than me, an elderly man, and he told me this story of, he he was physically in pain. He had been for many years from an injury. And he told me a story how he was at an altar and uh, he he was praying in this church service and he watched this feather fall down and hit the floor. And he told me that, I know that if I had only reached out and took hold of that feather, then I would have been made well. That's not how God works. That's not how he operates. The superstition of that is ridiculous. And and it it bugs me so much that there's so many out there 
who think this way because someone has taught foolishness as truth. They didn't think to question it. Oh, it bugs me so much. For longer than I had been alive, this man had been both physically and mentally in pain because of a spirituality of foolishness that was taught to him by someone. It really bugs me. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're in pain. You've heard one of those three things or another thought. And, and, and people have said, this is why you're still in pain. There's something you need to do. Or generational curse. That's another one that really bugs me. People say, well, you know, maybe your great, great, great grandfather did some great sin. And so now you are in a generational curse and you're paying for the sins of him. Christ spoke against this one. Christ said, stop saying that the father eats sour grapes and the son's mouth puckers or gets bitter. Um, and, and what he was saying there is stop saying that there's generational curses. It's, it's not a thing. Don't, don't let it be a thing. It's, it's not a thing. And so when people teach these things, it really bugs me because it allows people um, to then start looking in other places for their healing or, or for their faith when, um, when that's not where it should be found. We'll, we'll come back to that. Our last story comes from Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 27. It reads, And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed, and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing uh, about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth, foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long... Am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can... All things are possible for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. And when he arose, and, and, and he arose, the boy arose. Uh, in this story, we have some major differences from the last two. Uh, a very major difference, actually. In, first of all, let's look at how this man addresses Christ. The leper comes before him and bows, right? Uh, the Roman centurion actually calls Jesus Lord with a capital L. He, he recognizes that authority. This man, this father, he calls Jesus teacher. Now, was Jesus a teacher? Absolutely. He was so much more than that. And part of me wonders if that was the end of this man's understanding of who Christ was. We can't look too much into that with speculation, but it's possible. Um, and and is, is that how he saw him? So many people today, they look at Christ and they just simply say that he was a good moral teacher. And I wonder, is that what this man thought? But he obviously recognized that there was something different about him because he brought this problem that no one else can solve. And I read a story like this and it bugs me. I think of my own children and I think of what if one of my kids had a problem like that, that they grow up for so much of their life having seizures, basically, having possession, being thrown into water and fire and never feeling at ease, never feeling safe, always in fear of that moment. 
And to think of this man and all the people, the different rabbis he would have went to, the different medical professionals and, and gurus of the day and that kind of thing, and, and the different methods of help he would have tried to pursue. He's probably exhausted by it. And finally, he hears of this one who actually has healed people. And so he brings his boy to Christ. Notice the ask, though. The leper um, bows his knees and says, If you will, you can. The centurion calls out to Christ and says, You don't even need to come to my house. Simply say the word and it will be done. The father cries out in desperation and says, If you can do anything. And Jesus' response with an exclamation mark in the text, almost a sense of offense we can read into it, where he says, if I can. It's like, do you know who I am? Like, I, I can do anything. How dare you question what I'm capable of doing? Quickly, the man realizes um, his problem. And in his desperation, he, he has this statement, and this is what the entire sermon has been building up to. I intentionally, I was going to name on YouTube this sermon, um, I believe, help my unbelief, but I decided not to for the sake of building up to the point. But that's what I want to talk about today is that point. The man cries out and he says, I believe. And then in a sobering reality of, of his true heart, he says, help my unbelief. I imagine he's had so many people over the years who told him they can help his son. And he put his faith in them and they fell short over and over and over. And so here he is before this man, before God, before Christ. And he says, I, if you can, Christ responds, if I can, all things are possible to those who believe. And so the man cries out, I believe recognizes the doubt that he has in his heart. Help my unbelief. Here's the thing. People will tell you that you need to have perfect faith for God to work in your life. But here we have Christ working amongst a man who knows that his faith is broken, that his faith is not absolute, that in that there is a sense of help me, help me in my unbelief, help strengthen my faith. And I think that's something we need to often come to. I believe, help my unbelief. There's some other points here to make, but I, I want to drill that one home first. In, in your life, you'll go through times of struggle. You'll go through times of questioning and, and the problem of pain, right? Why is there suffering? Why do I go through pain? It's a great question. There's some logical answers to that. But sometimes, even with that logic, there's moments where it's just like, I don't understand why this is happening. Yeah, I've, I felt that way a lot about this year sometimes. But in that, don't feed your doubt. Just simply say to God, God, help build my faith up in you. That even when I don't understand, I'll still follow you in your ways. There's also the thing that we need to recognize that the answer isn't always yes. In these three stories, Jesus heals the man, the boy, the servant. But when Paul, one of his great followers who did so much for the church, cried out to Jesus through prayer three times because of this thorn in his flesh, which many, of myself included, agree was a problem with his eye, with his vision, that would have naturally harmed his ministry abilities, um, God's response was, I'm not going to heal you because in your weakness, I am made strong. And then he also says things like, lean on me. You know, may, may you operate in my strength, not yours. Take on my yoke um, and I'll take on your burden. And the answer isn't always yes. There's going to be times where we, we go through suffering. We go through pain. There's a lot that can be learned from that. I have learned a lot about God and His ways through the different blessings in my life and, and through, um, through, through goodness, as the world would call it. But I think I've actually learned a lot more in the suffering. I've learned a lot more in the pain that I've gone through in my life and, and recognized that Christ still walks with me when I'm in my pain. 
He does not abandon me. He does not leave me. And there's lessons to be learned. And my faith is grown when I know that God is with me throughout those troubled times. Pastor Tim talked about this uh, in the midweek video uh, this past week. Happy, uh, I thought it said happy trails at first, but happy trials and, and the trials that we go through. So may our response in these times be, Lord, strengthen my faith. And don't chase signs and wonders. Don't, don't chase healings. Chase the healer. Don't chase wonders and signs. Chase the wondrous one. Chase the one who makes those signs. Follow God. And recognize that with that, there might be times that are miraculous. But follow him even when it seems normal. Uneventful. Follow God anyways. Follow him in those moments. And recognize that you might have doubt. You might have fear. But in that, don't, don't feed the doubt. Don't feed the fear. Rather say to God, help me. Help grow my faith. And look at the perseverance and, and, and the partnership of the Holy Spirit alongside you as go, you go through those times and see that God is with you. And that should strengthen your faith. Part of me feels like drawing this out a little bit more, but I think I've made the point, and I feel this is what God wanted me to preach on this week, is, uh, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I hope that helps you this week. Uh, I hope you can draw closer to God and that you're growing, you're growing in your faith stronger and stronger every day. Recognize the things that he has done. Your testimony of the work of God. Uh, he's an act of God, active all around us. May his, his, his presence be a blessing to us. Love you guys. Have a good week. See ya.